as grace believers, as grace churches, many times we hear the question, well, what is a grace church? And uh, as some of you know, I, I recently wrote a book on the subject. What is a grace church? And I think sometimes we get the idea that, well, we're a grace church, so we have to show everybody how different we are. <laughs> and I think we sometimes do that to our, uh, uh, our own uh, demise. Uh, it's not our intention to be different, all right? It just kind of comes naturally when you rightly divide the word of truth. We're not trying to be different. But sometimes people say, well, what's the difference? We believe in uh, grace, right? We believe in salvation by grace. And I say, amen, great, I'm, I'm happy. But what is the one thing that really sets us apart as grace believers? And that is that we have come to recognize that God revealed a special and unique and distinctive message to the Apostle Paul for this dispensation. And sometimes we, again, we hear uh, people say, oh, Paul, Paul, Paul. You talk about his Paul. Um, and even, even good preachers have, have sort of made a joke of Paul. He had eye trouble, and that's a little play on words. You know, he had a physical eye problem, it's believed, but, but he also talked about himself a lot. In fact, right here in our text, a lot of people think that uh, here's this Paul guy, he's so full of pride, he has to point to himself all the time, for I speak to you Gentiles, and as much as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify my own. And I can see how people would misunderstand what he's really trying to communicate. But what we need to see is that he is not exalting himself when he says these things. In fact, when Paul talks about himself, he speaks in much different language. Things like, uh, me who uh, am less than the least of all saints. I mean, that's the attitude that Paul had in his own humility, least of all the saints. He, if anything, he looked down on himself just a little bit because he not only rejected the Lord Jesus Christ, but he persecuted those who followed him. I mean, you, you can't get much lower than that, all right? And, and I don't think that ever left him, even to the end of his days. He, he regretted having done that, but he rejoiced in the grace and mercy of God, of saving him out of that. And so uh, when he talked about himself, yes, less than the least of all saints, but when he talked about the ministry that was given to him, he brought it out to the forefront in a way that you just cannot ignore. And so let's begin. We're going to jump right in in verse number 13 and talk about the ministry of the Apostle Paul. For I speak to you Gentiles. And again, sometimes people wonder, well, why, why the emphasis on Paul's writings? Now, I hope you study your whole Bible. I try to read through it every year. I hope you study all scripture. Paul told us all scripture is profitable. For doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So all scripture is absolutely important. But as Vernell uh, talked about in his little, little pamphlet here, I, I want to get one of those, by the way. Uh, not all scripture is written directly to us. It's not all about us. The portion that God revealed to the Apostle Paul, Romans through Philemon, is that which directly is addressed to us today. And it ought to be studied and read like no other part of Scripture. Like dig in, search all Scripture, but really get to know Paul's epistle. That's God's mail to us today. Someone has uh, joked, you know, some people have a red letter edition. How many of you have a red letter edition? <laughs> I've got one. I didn't plan it that way. Somebody gave me the Bible, and I love it. All of Paul's letters should be read. R-E-D, because Paul himself said that the words that he spoke were the words of Christ. He says in 2 Corinthians, since you seek a proof of Christ speaking in me. Uh, 1 Corinthians 14, 37, let him that is spiritual acknowledge that the words that I speak are the commandments of the Lord. And so all of Paul's letters should be read R-E-D, but they should also be read R-E-A-D. Because 
Paul is our apostle. I speak to you Gentiles. Some people wonder, why Paul? Why Paul? Well, just think about it. God gave a message specifically to we Gentiles. Now, I know most of you know what a Gentile is. A Gentile is a non-Jew. But technically speaking, Paul uses the word for Gentiles that is also translated nations. Guess what? Israel is a nation. They are now on no different plane than the other nations. So Paul was their apostle too. Today, in this dispensation of grace, he's the apostle of all the nations. He's speaking to us. And I've had people ask me, well, how do you know, you know, when you first start writing the dividing word of truth, people get a little confused. Well, okay, well, John said this, and Peter said this, and Christ said this, and Moses said this. How do, how do I know when God's talking to me? Well, let's just look at it once more. For I, that's Paul, I speak to you Gentiles. Now let me ask you, how could, how could he have said it differently so that we would understand it? I mean, it's, it's pretty clear, isn't it? I speak to you Gentiles. All right, so now hopefully he's got our attention. And, and before I go through the rest of the verse, I want to point something out. He's not addressing us here particularly as the apostle of the body of Christ, even. And that's so important in this context, especially when you get to the part about the Gentiles being broken off. All right, he's talking about Gentiles as a whole in this particular context. Now, we know he's also the apostle to the body of Christ. There's so many other passages where, even in Romans, where he addresses the body of Christ. That would be the believers in this dispensation. But he's, spe he's specifically centering in on Gentiles as the nations. And then he says, inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles. Why Paul? You know, you talk about, we, we were mentioning uh, Harlan and Ginny Shriver. Well, Harlan has a brother in Australia named John. And um, if, how many of you know John, too? You know, you know John. And someone once told John, you're just like your brother Harlan, only more so. <laughs> and that makes perfect sense when you know those two fellows. Um, and John Shriver told me once that he was ministering in Australia. And Australia is a hard country to minister in. Very hard country to minister the gospel in. And he was working with a, a pastor of a denominational church trying to teach the grace message of the Pauline Revelation to him. And he said he just wasn't getting through to him. And he said, finally, he just, they got together one time for coffee or whatever, and he, and he told this pastor, he said, I just want to ask you one question. Why Paul? Why, two words. Why Paul? Why is the guy even in the Bible? Hadn't Christ already commissioned 12 apostles to go to the nations? Yes or no? Yes. Yeah, of course he did. He had already told 12 apostles to go into all the world and preach the gospel and to teach the nations. He had already commissioned them to do that. Why do you need this 13th guy? And of course, we know the answer to that. Let's just, I didn't want to flip away from Romans, but let's just go to Galatians because it's so helpful to understanding why Paul is emphasizing, I am the apostle of the Gentiles. And while you turn in there, you know, there are also churches that think they have apostles today. And um, I've even had uh, uh, preachers come to me and say, hey, our church has an apostle. And I like to answer, we do too. And our guy wrote half the New Testament. How do you like that? <laughs> uh, we have an apostle, and he, we have such a, a clear distinction between Paul and the other apostles, right here in Galatians chapter 2, verse 7, but contrarywise, when they, and they here refers to Peter, James, and John, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter, for he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. The twelve apostles, starting with Peter on down, were apostles to the circumcision, to Israel. 
Matthew 19, 28, Christ told Peter and the other apostles that they would sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And guess what? Paul's not going to be one of those. <laughs> he's, he's in the heavenlies with the body of Christ. They will be sitting on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, the church in general, and I don't care if it's Catholic or Protestant, has basically followed who? Peter and the Twelve. And yet, we read back in our... Let's get back and let's try to stay in Romans faster. Paul says, I am the apostle of the Gentiles. So what happened was, Israel was given 12 apostles for their 12 tribes. That's, that's really nice, isn't it? That fits, doesn't it? 12 tribes, 12 apostles. And they were to proclaim the gospel of the kingdom to all nations. That was Israel's purpose, to be a light to the nations and to shed light on darkness, bring them into the kingdom program. Christ would return, rule and reign on the earth. But what did Israel say? They would have none of it. They rejected Christ, they put him on a cross, they rejected the ministry of Peter and the other apostles in the early chapters of Acts, and God set them aside and called a new apostle, Paul, to go to the nations in spite of Israel's rejection of their responsibility to go to all nations. The apostles didn't reject it, but the nation, the, uh, nation Israel rejected them. And so God set them aside, and now we're under the ministry that was committed to Paul. So back here in Romans 11 and verse 13, for I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify myself? No, I magnify mine office. That is what he is trying to magnify. Now, I like the word magnify. Um, any of you kids have a magnifying glass? Don't they, don't you, they play, you don't like fry bugs and stuff? <laughs> <laughs> Good mind you. Uh, what does a magnifying glass do? Makes things appear larger, right? It focuses attention on a certain point, right? And that's exactly what Paul was trying to do. He's not trying to bring attention to himself. He's trying to bring attention to his office. It is because through that office, God revealed the message for today, the gospel of the grace of God. And why does he need to magnify it? Let me ask you this. And, and again, I've, I've, I've had this asked a hundred times, I'm sure. Why do, you, why do you emphasize Paul so much? Okay, if we don't, who will? <laughs> Who's going to? You're not going to hear this anywhere else. And I'm not trying to be a martyr. I'm not trying to say, oh, we're the only ones that know the truth. There are other grace churches. But there are very few churches that recognize the uniqueness of the message given to the Apostle Paul and the ministry and the apostleship of Paul. I magnify mine office. If we don't point that out, who will? Now, there was a purpose for God doing this towards Israel. And that's the interesting part of this. You know, God didn't turn to the Gentiles only because Israel was failing at her duty and he wanted the Gentiles to be saved. That's a big reason why he turned to the Gentiles. But he had another motive in turning to the Gentiles. We find that in verse 14. If by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are of my flesh and might save some of them. God's intention, and therefore Paul's intention, was that by turning to the Gentiles, the Israelites would be provoked to emulation, provoked to jealousy, provoked to envy. The scripture uses all of those words. He wanted Israel to become jealous because God had now turned his favor towards the Gentiles. And he hoped that Israel would be provoked by that. You know, sometimes there's a reason to provoke 
There's a verse in Hebrews about that. Um, provoking one another to good works. Sometimes we need to be prodded a little bit. And that's what God's doing here. And if we have time, I'm going to explain how he does that. His intention. But I want to just spend a few minutes looking at the end of verse 14. And might save some of them. What was always at the heart of Paul's ministry, apostleship, preaching, writing, purpose. Always that he might save some of them. Now we understand that he doesn't mean he can personally save them from their sin. He doesn't mean he personally pays the price for their sin, personally convert, confers righteousness to them when they believe. He's not saying he has the power to do that. But, you know, I find Paul using that language more than once. In 1 Corinthians 7, when he talks about the person who is married to an unbeliever, which sometimes happens. Maybe you were both lost when you got married and only one got saved. Sometimes that happens. He says, stay together. Who knows, O oh man, whether thou shalt save thy wife? And again, it's the same idea. It's not saying you have the power to save them, but you have the power to share the gospel with them. You have the power to minister to them. Paul said, I'm all things to all men. Those that are under the law is under the law. Those that are without law is not under the law, but under the law of Christ. You know the passage. That by all means, I might, what? Save some of them. That was his heart. And so in the context of why did God turn away from Israel? To the Gentiles. Yes, he wanted the Gentiles to be saved, but he also wanted Israel to become jealous, and maybe through that, some of them would be saved. Always at the heart of Paul's ministry and message. You know, and the irony of it is, uh, you know, almost every Christian denomination would say, oh, we want to see people saved. And yet very few of them are really preaching the gospel that was committed to Paul, the only gospel by which you can be saved today. You're not saved today by repenting and being baptized like Peter preached in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. That's not how you're saved today. You're saved by believing the gospel, that Christ died for your sins, was buried, rose again the third day according to the scripture. Putting your trust and confidence in what he did, not in what you were doing. And might save some of them. Verse 15, for if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world. Now, Paul has already talked about Israel stumbling and falling. And we talked about that last time. There's a process that went on. They sort of tripped on Christ, the stumbling stone. They expected him to be the great conquering deliverer. And here he goes and gets himself crucified. They stumbled over that. And then they fell alongside, literally, fell alongside the Gentiles. God put them on the same plane. And then he cast them away. And again, the casting away is not forever. As he began the chapter in verse 1, I say, then hath God cast away his people? God forbid. No, they're not cast away forever. But they are for a season. Verse 15, for if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world. Oh my, we just, hit a, we just hit a word that we should spend several weeks on. The reconciling of the world. That takes us to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed to us the ministry of reconciliation. When Israel was set aside... The status of the world was changed because of the sacrifice of Christ. He paid for their sins so they could now freely come to God by faith. The reconciling of the world. What shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? In other words, if God brought the reconciliation message of 
the gospel to the world through the casting away of Israel. Imagine what it'll be like when Israel is brought back. And again, I say there will be the greatest revival that's ever been seen during the tribulation period. There will be innumerable believers come out of the great tribulation. Just read the book of Revelation, where John sees the great multitude from all tongues and nations. There will be a great revival during the tribulation period. So when Israel is brought back into favor, yes, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? Verse 16, for if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. And at this point, the Apostle Paul begins using an illustration, an analogy that I think has confused some. It has, it has dismayed even many dispensationalists because they think that Paul is now plugging us into Israel's program. And that's really not what he's talking about here. And I want to just show you a few specifics in this passage of what Paul is illustrating here when it comes to the olive tree. Verse 16, if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy. Um, that's an illustration going back to the Old Testament. The first fruit was the, uh, the offering that was made at harvest time to show to God the thanks of the people for providing a harvest. And so they, they give the first part. If that's holy, the lump, the rest of it is holy too. And, and now he's sort of switching his analogy a little bit, if the root be holy, so also are the branches. And he's going to be talking about the root now. And the root that he's talking about is the root of the olive tree. And I'm going to get, just give you a really short overview. If you're a note taker, take these notes down. We don't have time to look them all up today. Um, write down Judges 9. I guess you could put that up there. Judges 9, 8 through 13. And in the Old Testament, God used three plants to illustrate spiritual truth. And the first of them is the vine. And are those all up there? The trees went forth, said unto the olive tree, and so forth. Uh, should I leave my fatness? Verse 9, verse 10. The tree said to the fig tree, come and reign over us. The fig tree said, should I forsake my sweetness and good fruit? Uh, the tree said to the vine, come and reign over us. The vine said, should I leave my wine, which cheereth God and man, and be promoted over the trees? So you've got these three trees. You've got the vine, the fig tree, and the olive tree. And I'm just going to give you a, a series of references. You don't need to put them all up for now, but write them down if you're taking notes. Uh, the vine represents Israel's national life. Psalm 80, verses 8 through 19. Isaiah 5. The vine had a reference to Israel's uh, wonderful national life that God wanted to establish. The second is the fig tree refers to uh, Israel's religious life. Judges 9-11 talks about the good fruit. Israel's religious life had to do with bearing fruit worthy of their faith. That was represented by the fig tree. Um, the olive tree is a representation of spiritual life, Israel's spiritual life. Uh, he talks about the fatness. That would be spiritual prosperity. Genesis 8 11, when the dove was sent forth out of the ark after the flood, came back with an olive leaf. That represented new life springing forth on the earth. Again, just an Old Testament type of spiritual life coming forth. This is the background for Romans chapter 11, as he talks now about the root of the olive tree. Again, verse 17. And if some of the branches be broken off, and thou being a wild olive tree wert grafted in among them, and with them partakest of the root and fatness of the olive tree, boast not against the branches. But if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. 
Now, I find it very significant that he refers over and over to the root. He's not even, he's, he's trying to be so careful in his analogy that we don't get the wrong idea. He's not talking about Israel's vine. He's not talking about Israel's fig tree. He's talking about the olive tree, which provides spiritual sustenance. And he's not even talking about the trunk so much as he's talking about the roots. And I will say this. It is no violation of our dispensational beliefs to say that we tap in with roots to the same spiritual source as Israel did. It's Christ. It's always Christ in any dispensation. But what he's saying is now, Gentiles are being plugged in. Now, there, there are two things I want to point out about this. One is from the natural perspective. And, and I just uh, came across this. Uh, someone shared this with me a couple of years ago. And, and I think it's true, fitting into this context. Um, I've never been on for grafting. I think I tried it once when I was a little kid. I cut a little notch in a tree and I took another, you know, and it didn't work. <laughs> it just didn't work. But say the graft sticks, right? And it takes. Why do people graft different varieties into a common stock? Sometimes they're looking for certain characteristics and so forth. But one of the features, I'm told, of grafting is that the way to get natural branches to produce better is to stick a couple of wild branches in there. And it creates a sort of biological or horticultural competition. And it can tend to actually make the natural branches produce more by just sticking a couple of unnatural branches in there. So from the purely local standpoint, and by that I mean in Paul's day, He's simply saying God still wants Israel to produce. Now, we know he's, that he set them aside. But he wanted Israel to produce. So he's starting to stick these, nat these unnatural branches in and says some of the branches, natural branches, were broken off. He's trying to get some of them to produce. Now, here's uh, someone has referred to some of my teaching as Finkology. And uh, you know who you are. <laughs> but I say that cautiously when uh, here's what I think is going on and I don't have a specific verse to tell you so I want you to take it in that light when Paul wrote Romans that's one of his earlier books he doesn't know how long the dispensation of grace is going to go on I don't think he knows it's going to go on for 2,000 years I think he envisions that God will finish up his work with the Gentiles in his lifetime and that he'll just go right back to Israel when, he talks, when Paul talks about the rapture, he includes himself. We who are alive and remain under the coming of the Lord. So I think Paul, at this point in his ministry, early on, is, is envisioning God is sticking these, this, this Gentile program into Israel to sort of prod them on. And when he's finished with the Gentiles, he'll take them out, and Israel will have been thoroughly revived, and they'll go on with the kingdom program. And we're going to see that even later in Romans chapter 11. Now, uh, having said that, I also believe later on in Paul's ministry, you get to 2 Timothy, Paul realizes this is it. I'm out of here. Don't really know how long this is going to go on. <laughs> All right? So that's one aspect of why God grafted in these Gentiles into the olive tree was to get Israel going again. But we now know that that didn't happen. And so the warning here still stands in verse 18, Boast not against the branches, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. If thou wilt say the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in, well, <laughs> because of unbelief they were broken off, and thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he also spare not thee. Now let's just stop there a moment. I believe in eternal security. Do any of you believe in eternal security? Yeah, I think probably most of you do. And yet, some people come to a verse like this and they say, well, watch out. If God spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he spare not thee. You're going to get broken off too. And here we come back to the whole key to the passage. Remember, I told you right at the start. Look at verse 13 again. For I speak to you, saved members of the body of Christ, uh -uh. Gentiles. You see, when Israel was chosen to be God's vessel to bring the gospel of the kingdom to the world, 
That doesn't mean everybody in the nation of Israel was saved, does it? In fact, we know that most of them were not saved. God always spoke of the true believers as a remnant. He broke off Israel nationally. He didn't take away the salvation of the few believers in Israel at that time, did he? Of course not. And when God ends this dispensation and breaks off the Gentiles, he's breaking off the Gentiles in general. He's not taking away the salvation of those who are saved at that time. So it's so important to just take it as he says it. It's the nations he's talking about. It's the Gentiles he's talking about. The Gentiles have the privilege today of being the channel through which God brings the message of salvation to the world. Why do we take that so lightly? That's what he's talking about. Verse 22, Behold, therefore, the goodness and the severity of God on them which fell, severity, but toward thee goodness. If thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shalt be cut off. Not you individually as a believer, but the nations as a whole, the Gentiles. And they also, verse 23, if they abide not, still in unbelief shall be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. For if thou wert cut out of the olive tree, which by, is by, wild by nature, and wert grafted in contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these which be natural branches be grafted in their own, into their own olive tree? And that sets the stage for the next portion, which you'll have to wait till the third week of December, I think, is what I'm scheduled next or fourth, I forget. Uh, the Lord willing, will be back if the rapture doesn't come first. All righty, and I want to close with this. If you have never trusted Christ, you are still living and breathing and have the opportunity to do so today. You might not have that opportunity to tomorrow. So if you have never trusted him, put your faith in what Christ has done for you. And I've probably said it before, I heard a really, a really simple, profound statement on our preaching tour, one of the other preachers said, who was the very first one to trust in the finished work of Christ, the blood of Christ, as being sufficient for the payment of sin? Who was the very first one to, to believe that? And the answer was God. <laughs> God came up with this idea. He believed that his son would be able to pay the full price for your sin. That's why he sent him to the cross to die. And now what we need to do is, is believe the same thing God the Father believes put our trust in Christ. Yes, I believe that what Christ did is sufficient for me. Let's pray.